Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is a 2015 uh, Thomas E. Noonan Distinguished Lecture. So Tom uh, couldn't join us today. Uh, he's somewhere. And, uh, but uh, he's a very important member of our advisory board. Uh, was, uh, was chairman for a, while, for a long time. Still on the board. And a major figure in the entrepreneurship scenery in Georgia and Atlanta. And uh, today's uh, Tom Noonan's distinguished lecture is uh, Peter Freeman, our founding dean. Title of his talk, Surprise in COC History, who was responsible for starting computing at Georgia Tech? I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to this because uh, every time I meet him, I learn something new about the place I've been already almost five years, but it turns out I, do, I know very little. So Peter needs hardly any introduction uh, at Georgia Tech, uh, much less in the College of Computing, but I'll share a few things about him. He earned his PhD in computer science from Carnegie Mellon in 1970 and became the founding dean of COC upon the college formation in 1990. We are celebrating the 25th year of the college. Prior to joining Georgia Tech, he served as director of NSF Computer and Computation Research. Just before he came to Atlanta, he spent a year as visiting distinguished professor at George Mason University, where he helped establish that university computing program. In addition to his role as COC Dean, Peter also served as Georgia Tech CIO and oversaw the Office of Information Technology prior to the 1996 Olympics. While COC Dean, Peter oversaw the college's rapid growth, including the hiring of many more faculty, the establishment of multiple research centers, and growth in external research funding from roughly 10, 2 million to $10 million per year. Upon leaving Georgia Tech in 2002, Peter became assistant director of NSF for size, computer and information science and engineering. That's the division of NSF that all of us get sometimes funding if we are lucky. A post he held until 2007. Since 2007, Peter has been doing strategic consulting, but came out of retirement, Georgia Tech retirement, at least this year, to help us with a very special project. Peter has agreed to capture and write a definitive history, not only of the college, but of computing at Georgia Tech. You know, the college is 25 years, computing at Georgia Tech is 50 years, but we are really cheating. P Peter, is it 60? 70. Uh, same order of magnitude. The project, the project has several components that I'm sure he'll discuss in the lecture, and I can't think of anyone better positioned to write such a history than Peter Freeman. Please welcome Peter Freeman. Thank you, Zvi. It's always good to be back on campus and to see so many friends a little bit older now and friendly faces from around campus. I wasn't certain, I really appreciate your coming, I wasn't certain how many people would come so I brought my wife and some, <laughs> uh, and some former neighbors and I found a couple of guys sort of sitting on the street, and they'll be here in a few minutes. But, uh, and Zvi, I have to say thank you not only for the nice introduction, but for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, do this lecture, um, because it has afforded me the uh, opportunity to get to know a whole lot more and to discover some what I found really interesting stories that actually form an interesting story arc, which uh, we'll get to in due time. Um, I think this is actually only the second lecture at Georgia Tech that I've ever been invited to give. The first was when I was, 
Pardon me? No, the first, aside from my uh, uh, duties as dean and, and uh, a, a professor, because I taught essentially every term, and so I was always you know, being asked to do this and that and the other, but on campus. Uh, the first one was when I was being interviewed for Dean in late 1989. This is the second one, so that's 26 years. If you wait another 26 years, I'll be approximately 100, and I'm not sure I will show up. So, uh, or they may carry me in in a long, flat uh, carrier. So uh, listen carefully, please. Maybe the last time you hear me speak, although I doubt it. Tom Noonan, I had hoped would be here this afternoon. We communicated some by email a few weeks ago, and he said, I really wanted to be here to, to hear you. Tom was a longtime chairman. I brought him onto the advisory board back when his company had about 40 or 50 employees. His and, and Chris's. Very glad to see Chris here as well. Um, and, uh, but Tom, indicated he was giving a speech this afternoon as well uh, in Zurich, Switzerland, at the Stock Exchange. So he didn't think he could get back in time. So sends his regrets. Fundamentally, what I've been trying to do, and it's not finished, as Z at least implied, is to understand where we came from. There's a set of questions. Let's see if we can make things work here. Yes. There's a set of questions, and I think what I have to say today will um, partially answer at least the first three, but it certainly isn't going to answer the fourth, and at best will be um, maybe kind of a setup for that. Uh, so the fundamental question is, how did we get here? to our own building, which was completed in, I believe, 1989-90 was the first academic year. I arrived um, that following summer, summer of 90, as the first dean, had this grand building. Um, and uh, of course, we now have an even grander building. Thank you, Chris Klaus. And so that, Arc is something that will be talked about. I'm not going to talk about my. I tried to get Z not anything other than here's your former dean, but as introduction. But because I figured if anybody was here, they'd already know who I was and probably more about me than I'd prefer to have spoken. But um, let's begin. And what I'm going to do is to take you on a journey back through time, as opposed to starting at the start and going forward, which is kind of pedestrian and linear, I decided, let's go back. So let's start with this man. Anybody know who that is? Yes, of course. Everybody, or half of the people in the room certainly should have because you worked under him. And he probably signed off your tenure papers or whatever. John Patrick Cresign was president of Tech from 1987 to 1994. He relished ideas. He was a true visionary. He could make useful connections where no one else saw them. And he insisted on the highest quality in everything we did. But he could also be rash, dismissive of boring topics like management details, headstrong, and ultimately stubborn to the point of antagonizing even his employer, the Board of Regents. And for those of us that were here in 1994, we know the sad end of that particular tale. Pat loved people, especially students. He loved baseball and softball. He played softball because according to his son Rob, who I've been in touch with recently, um, Pat's athletic ability wasn't up to hardball, at least on the court and uh, on the field. Uh, so he played softball, and he used to uh, do slow pitch softball here, and apparently was a pretty good pitcher. He was also a, uh, a champion swimmer in college, uh, setting uh, a number of varsity records uh, at his alma mater that stood for over 30 years. 
He also loved sailing, and after we were awarded the Olympics in 1990, the 96 Olympics were awarded, as is usually done these days, six years in advance. Uh, in 1992, um, Pat decided to indulge his love of sailing, and he decided to sail the Atlantic to visit Barcelona, where the 92 Olympics were being held, so that he could observe them firsthand. Now, you have to understand that the 50-foot boat that he had recently bought, that he sailed from Savannah to Barcelona, had a crew of four besides Pat, Rob, his son, uh, three young men, ran into one of them at lunch today, Blake Patton, who gave me some additional interesting uh, stories. Um, and they got there eventually, but they encountered some severe storms. Their navigation equipment went out after the first week. It was uh, the height of hurricane season. So you can imagine that it was some uh, sail, especially since none of them, including Pat, the captain, had ever done ocean open sailing. Go figure. It drove Mike Thomas, who was provost at the time, nuts because Mike was left in charge of the campus and he couldn't communicate with the boss. And he had to make important decisions because we were starting construction for the uh, Olympic venues and all of that. There was an awful lot going on in the summer of 92. And the president just sails off into the blue. In any event, they survived, and the campus survived, too. You might recognize Pat in this picture. Does everybody recognize Pat? Do you know who the other two are? Who's the one in the middle? Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. Very good. And who's the one on the right? I should say on the far right. <laughs> Ross Perot. Ross Perot. Famed entrepreneur, two-time third-party candidate for President of the United States. That was the board of the next computer company. Remember N little e X T? There were a bunch of them here when I arrived. I never quite understood why until I saw this picture sitting on the entry table to the president's home. It was something Pat was, was quite... Um, involved in and quite proud of, and in fact, apparently, had quite an impact on. Rob sent me a nice little story, and he relates the following, quote, as I remember it, the summer that Steve was fired from Apple, 1986, he called Pat and asked what kind of computer would be necessary for the next step forward. Pat gave him a detailed answer down to the bits and bytes. And Rob says that he heard, overheard that conversation and a whole series of conversations the rest of the summer because their home in Pittsburgh at the time uh, was not air conditioned. <coughs> Pittsburgh summers can be hot and muggy. And Pat's office was next to Rob's uh, bedroom, a young boy then, probably 10 or something, on the third floor. And so he overheard all these conversations. Bottom line, this guy that was a visionary kept good company and learned from, obviously, those people, and they were learning from him. Pat's properly credited, I think, with creating the College of Computing because, indeed, he, or I should say the reorganization of campus that he initiated, the academic reorganization, was the catalyst and in particular, uh, there were a number of committees, faculty committees, the usual study committees and all set up. And the specification that he wrote for a computing committee, little c, says, there should be a computing college to give ourselves and the world a clear idea of the importance of computing in the academic and research life of Georgia Tech. So he's the guy that did indeed bring a bunch of things together and created the uh, opportunity for what we have today. 
But before Pat, there was Pete. Everybody should know this gentleman, Pete Jensen. Even some of you that uh, have as much white hair as I do, um, who probably studied under him, had courses from him. Alton P. Jensen, his official name, was known and loved by all. When he passed away in 2005, at the age of 79, Pete had played numerous roles in his over 50 years at Tech. He started as a student in mechanical engineer, engineering, and he finished as my first associate dean. He chaired the computing committee, and I've gone back and read some of the uh, minutes from those meetings, it was clear that there were a lot of competing ideas. Is there anyone in the room actually that was on that committee? I know there's still several faculty members from around campus that were on that committee. Um, and I believe Saeed Mohammedian, uh, who's a member of the advisory board, is Saeed here? Saeed, were you on the committee? No, I was uh, just part of the outside. You were one of the outside informants, okay. But there certainly were a number of you around here at that time. And Pete steered that committee uh, very skillfully to a result, which I suspect was what he knew all along was the correct result. But he did it and apparently did not anger people because when I arrived in 1990, I had all kinds of people from across campus coming and saying, hey, what can we do to help? It's a great idea. Pete taught thousands of students and individually advised uh, in a very meaningful way a lot more people than would fit in this room. He tutored dozens of local entrepreneurs, legislators, including the former speaker, Newt Gingrich, who spoke at his memorial service that was held in this room, and governors, I think probably including Governor Carter, because Pete was later asked to uh, chair an important national IT committee uh, under President Carter. Pete taught me much of what I know about tech, even more about people, especially Southern people, <laughs> and a lot about faculty. I drunk it in, usually at his home in the evening along with several glasses of good scotch. He would have guessed, who would have guessed, that such an outspoken person as Newt Gingrich, I'll refrain from using a more colorful term to describe Newt's behavior, um, would have such a lasting and deep respect for Pete that nearly 30 years later, uh, Newt Gingrich said to me in a, a visit that he paid to the college here after he stepped down from being uh, Speaker of the House, he taught me everything I know about computers and systems thinking. Pete was also very proud of his infantry service in World War II, was awarded the Silver Star for gallantry, and even his wife Judy of many, many years did not know that until he passed away in 2005. He continued to attend annual reunions of his comrades almost to the end of his life. Our backwards journey, though, doesn't stop with Pete. Getting a little further back here. Anybody? Ray Miller. Ray Miller. Yeah, well, there are a few of you around the room that have been here a lot longer than I have. <laughs> Annie. <laughs> this is true. True? Hey, three degrees from here. Raymond E. Miller was chair of ICS from 1980 to 1987. He's a true computer pioneer. Ray had been with IBM for 30 years prior to coming to Atlanta in 1980. As a well-known theoretician who gave great service to our field in many capacities, he was widely known and had many well-placed friends in our field across the country. He later moved to the University of Maryland, where today at 85, he still comes into his university office regularly. Ray was clearly the right man at the right time, dramatically increasing the technical force, focus and resource base of ICS. That's the information and 
Computer Science School. The original school, as you'll hear in a minute, was named Information Science. It got changed along about 1970. And all of these details and a, a written form of this speech you can find on a website that we'll talk about in a minute. Ray was able to obtain enhanced financial support, hire a cohort of outstanding faculty to complement those already in place and obtain approval for starting and guiding the design of what is now the College of Computing Building. So one answer to the question, how did we get here, is Ray Miller engineered that, if you will, and helped design it. Interestingly, before coming to Georgia Tech, Ray had done research and published papers with two of our current faculty members, Rich DeMillo, and is Dick Lipton here? And Dick Lipton. Indeed, it was a call from Rich in 1979 that alerted him to the search for a new chair. And perhaps even more there was going on in the background that Rich convinced Ray to come. Let me share with you one personal note, an aside from the memoir I haven't written yet, is that um, Rich DeMillo was involved in my learning from Rich LeBlanc former faculty member, former associate dean, who's now a department chair on the West Coast, that there was a new college being formed here and they were looking for a dean. Because in 1989, Rich had followed me in that position at NSF. We were, I was still in Washington. We were having dinner every few weeks. One evening, Rich calls up and says, hey, can I bring my friend Rich LeBlanc along? And I said, oh yeah, that'd be fine. Uh, I've, heard of him, I've just never had the opportunity to meet him. The rest of that story is yet to be told too. Due to his efforts, the time was then ripe in 1987 for Pat Cresign, Pete Jensen, and a cohort of strong faculty, many or some of, you, some of those being here this afternoon, to fashion a new college on a solid and broad foundation. So let's continue our journey backwards further. We're getting back further. Who is this gentleman? Vladimir Shlomeka. Thank you. I'm, I'm getting a gold star today, because I'm just every Well, you always were a good student, but you know, Annie, maybe you don't need to make that point. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mean to put it, put you I was down. A very young student. You were. You started about age five, weren't you? That's right. I thought so. Vladimir Slomeka was the founding director of the School of Information Science in 1964. He was born in 1928, entered the university during World War II in Czechoslovakia, where he lived. He then was kicked out of the university when the communists took over in 1949, escaped the country, lived in a refugee camp for two years, made his way to Australia on a fluke. The immigration officer that was interviewing these refugees in Vienna or somewhere was blind and couldn't see that Vladimir had uh, a, a broken or a leg that was game because of a skiing accident. And otherwise, Australia was not taking undesirable, shall we say, uh, people that couldn't come and work hard. So he was off to Australia. When he landed, the uh, immigration authorities were about to put him on the next boat out until a doctor came to see what the problem was, saw the leg and said, oh, I think we can fix that in my hospital. He protected Vladimir for over a year when Vlad uh, sat in that hospital having his leg repaired. And this good doctor did that because some Czech citizens in World War II had saved a young Australian soldier, namely this doctor, from being killed. So things go around. He escaped that deportation, studied in Australia, 
eventually uh, getting degrees in physical sciences. He moved back to Europe, worked in Munich as a chemical engineer. He and a colleague uh, eventually developed a uh, uh, chemical process and received nine patents on it. Those experiences resulted in his being fluent, as many Europeans are, I guess, in five languages and giving him solid confidence in his abilities, which were demonstrated when he then moved to the United States. He was going to Chicago to live with his aunt, his father's sister. Unfortunately, she died the day before he arrived. So his introduction to his new country was to arrange a funeral in a strange city. But he managed that, and after uh, tidying up her affairs, moved to New York City, entered Columbia, and in 1962 received his PhD in library science, although basically he had crafted for himself a information science program. And if you do the math there, from the time he left Czechoslovakia as a refugee in 1949, two years in a refugee camp, etc., 13 years. I mean, that's only about twice the time that a lot of graduate students take to get their PhD these days, with all due respect, and it's not their fault necessarily. Vladimir's uh, advisor at Columbia was also a pioneer, Mortimer Talby. Talby was a uh, pioneer in non-numeric processing using computers. And he had formed the world's first uh, com company devoted to non-numeric computing in Washington. Probably one of the early Beltway bandits doing work for DOD and other three-letter agencies in, in the capital. When Vladimir um, graduated, Mortimer asked him to come down to Washington and be his first director of research at this company, which had grown from 10 people to 500. He was there for two years before coming here. He was approached, actually, in late 1963 about moving, uh, coming to uh, Georgia Tech. And his response was that he'd never been south of Washington, although he kind of vaguely knew where Atlanta was on a map, and he had never heard of Georgia Tech. But apparently he was convinced, so he came for a talk, just saying, well, I'm curious about the world, I'd like to see a little more of it. And um, he was favorably impressed. He noted that he liked engineering schools because they did something concrete. To his surprise, his an, att an attractive offer of employment, far above the usual faculty salary, was made to him on the spot at the end of his visit. It was clearly a unique opportunity to be the founding director of a new unit. I can identify with that. And so after talking it over with his wife, they moved in the summer of 1964. But his real introduction to the South came later that summer when he was signing the usual stack of papers that all new employees have to sign. When he turned them in to the clerk to make sure everything was in order, she read them, looked up at him, and said, quote, man, you've had it here. You are a foreigner, a Catholic, and you didn't fill out the question on your race. Did you get here by bus? You must be one of those troublemakers coming to the South this summer. This was his introduction to the South in 1964. Today it's hard to imagine those uh, times, and that applies not only to that little story, but to the situation at Georgia Tech. When he started, he was the only permanent faculty member in the school of IS. His budget was solely an NSF grant, soft money. 
and he had one room assigned to him in the basement of the double E building for his office and that of his secretary, but at least he had a secretary. The Rich Computer Center in the Rich Building, still the campus uh, computer center, had a modern B5000 computer, but that had to serve the whole campus, and there was no equipment for the new school. A few professors on campus taught application courses using computers, but there was almost nothing we would recognize today. When Slameka arrived, there was already an approved school, a curriculum for a master's degree in information science, an, inf an NSF grant, another one, of $200,000, a few acting faculty, and even a student waiting in the wings. Joanne Butterworth became the first graduate of Georgia Tech to receive a degree in any computing subject the following June. Those early years must have been hectic, hectic and stressful as Slameka tried to develop a better curriculum, deliver promised courses, and hire new faculty. One expedient and fortuitous thing he did was to bring into uh, the, uh, onto his staff, or at least teaching for him, was to bring on Pete Jensen and John Goda, both of whom were working in the computer center. Pete, of course, later became a professor talked about him. John Goda, many of you knew, and taught for us very successfully until he retired in 2002. While there was a curriculum of sorts in place, Slameka knew immediately that something more current and grounded was needed. So he quickly developed a new framework that could also serve as a guide for hiring tenure track faculty for the fledgling school. He had three main themes in that plan that I believe can still be seen in the college. Those themes were, first, the design of information systems, secondly, the design of the computer systems to implement them, and third, development of the theories that underlie those first two activities and inform them. There was rapid growth in students and faculty, demand for more technical courses, and so on. The faculty he hired produced future leaders, including Rich DeMillo, Craig Mundy, former number two at Microsoft, Edith Mar Martin, former head of DOD Research and Development, and several future department chairs at other universities. There's an interesting story about another one of those early faculty members, Pranis Zundi, who many of you uh, knew, who taught for us until 1997. Uh, I won't go into that in the interest of time, but I'll just say that it was Pranis' uh, work in systems engineering as a graduate student in the industrial engineering department that convinced them to change the name to the current in industrial and systems engineering school. I can imagine Mike Thomas might not want to admit that. In any event, uh, uh, Zundi came into the department uh, in the late 60s, into the school. Uh, everybody here understands school department, for those of you that don't, uh, it's confusing, but school equals department for all intents and purposes. Another first that presaged one of the most successful campus programs today was a joint degree in biomedical information and computer science with Emory School of Medicine. Unfortunately, it didn't last long. There's a story behind that that Rich tells me also, but again, I'll skip over that. After Vladimir stepped down as director in early 1987, he focused on the design and development of information systems for developing countries around the world and worked with them in country with a number of different countries. He built the school from almost nothing to a respected and active group of computer science and information faculty, grew the student population from one, Joanne Butterworth, to 500, oversaw and helped the development of a full suite of undergraduate and graduate courses, hired a number of faculty who were or later became nationally recognized in their fields, 
establish the ethos of teaching and research in the new school, which for those of us from other uh, more established graduate schools uh, knew, well, of course, that's the way it's done. Georgia Tech didn't do it that way. That was not a common practice at Georgia Tech. So in that way, again, the college was a leader in helping establish what is now de rigueur. His record, when you look back at it, very good for 15 years. But it begs the question, why did he come to Tech? Who made sure he received an acceptable offer? Who was responsible for the program? The organizational approvals all the way up through the Board of Regents for that master's program and the NSF funding that was awaiting his arrival. Let's let Vladimir tell you in his own words. Mrs. Dorothy Crossland. She was the director of libraries right. at Georgia Tech. And Dorothy Crossland was a, an, an unbelievable and a unique person. She was really the only woman in the upper administration of a man, man's male institution, college. male college, and in the South on top of it. But she, I think, had an uncanny sense. First of all, she was a superb librarian, and she built a superb library. And she built it all with non-Georgia Tech funds. Uh, she got contributions from other people, didn't right. she? Right, and she got grants and monies from and so on. And she was the kind of a person who would never take no for an answer. <laughs> so when she wanted something, she would ignore the president of Georgia Tech and go directly to the chairman of the Board of Regents. And if she couldn't find it from the Board of Regents, she'd go directly to the legislature or she would go to the governor directly, bypassing whatever it. it whatever it took, she would do. I should point out that's taken from a, a video interview done in 1998 by Marilyn Summers, uh, who runs the Living History Project for the Alumni Association. It was one of the early ones, and the voice you hear in the background is Marilyn. Uh, she interviewed me uh, uh, last fall. Uh, there are others, obviously, that unfortunately were not interviewed before they uh, passed on or otherwise left. So, introducing the mother of the College of Computing, Dorothy Crossland. Dorothy Murray Crossland, Dot, as everyone called her, was the director of the Georgia Tech Library from 1927 to 1971. She was born in 1903 in Stone Mountain, Georgia. She attended Girls High, where she played basketball and was voted the most fashionable girl in her senior class. And she then attended the Carnegie Library Science School. When she started working here on campus at the library, which was called the Carnegie Library, and was housed in the building that's now the administration building. It had only 16,000 volumes, large for an individual, but nothing for a research university or even a liberal arts school. 100 parodical subscriptions and only two other employees. She received many local and national accolades over her career, and when she retired in 1971, the governor declared the day as Dorothy M. Crossland Day. Actually, in the late 30s, before World War II, or as it was breaking out, Dot uh, set about a, on a campaign to enlarge the holdings of the library. She knew there would not be any uh, institute money for it, so she started raising money privately. After the war ended, she really stepped up that activity and obtained funds to expand the library holdings. Her goal was to make the library as good as that of the Georgia Tech of the North. That's also known as MIT to some of you. In 1946, think about it, 1945, the war in Europe wasn't over until May, was it, June? and then uh, VJ Day in August. She went to Europe in 1946. She made a remarkable trip. It was a buying trip. 
She covered 13,000 miles and eight countries in 24 days. You could hardly do that today. And we, needless to say, everything was broken still in Europe at that point. The results were remarkable and comprise a large part of the over five linear miles of books, out of print books, rare books, and out of print journals that she acquired during her tenure as librarian, and most of that came from that one trip. But of course, when she got home, the little Carnegie building wasn't big enough to house it. So she set about to raise the funds, private sources again, but some state funds apparently, to build a larger building. That building is today still the main library building on campus. She also, it turns out, was an interior, registered interior designer. So she personally selected the decor and furnishings for the new building. It was her building. I didn't, I don't know, does Ellen gone? I don't know whether Ellen did that for the Klaus building or not. I don't think so. <laughs> Pretty close though, yeah. And there are a few little features I'm responsible for probably, but that's another story. Um, in any event, her next campaign was to get women admitted to Georgia Tech. So again, using her political skills, connections, tenacity, she convinced everybody that women should be admitted. And women were admitted in 1952. Accomplishments of the magnitude of Dorothy Crossland would be pretty outstanding today for anyone, male or female. But remember at that time, as Vladimir said in his little intro, there were no women in the upper administration here. It was an all-male school. It was in the South. In 1952, there were still very sexist attitudes expressed publicly. For example, one regent noted when discussing the resolution to admit women, there's where we get the women get their nose under the tent. Next, we'll have a home economics major at Georgia Tech. <laughs> she persevered. She launched her final major campaign, and the one that is most relevant, entirely relevant, to our story here, in the late 50s. She claimed to have never understood anything about computers. But she had heard about their use in information handling while attending national library science conferences. She had an intuition that they would be much more important far beyond their use as calculating machines. And she decided that tech should be a leader in this new field. And she set about to make that happen. It was a fortuitous time. The Russians had launched Sputnik, the first orbiting Earth satellite, in 1957. That created all kinds of furor in the country. And people said, oh my god, we're, we're terrible. We've got, to, we've got to upgrade our science facilities and everything. One of the results was the creation of an Office of Science Information at the National Science Foundation, created to help um, uh, scientists uh, discover information. Didn't have Google in those days. So it turned out that the first head of that was an old friend of Dot's. So she called him up and said, I need funds to hold two conferences here on campus on how to educate professionals in this new field of information science. He funded them. They were very successful. They brought people from all over the country, from abroad, and it only reinforced her commitment and her intuition that this was going to be something important and Georgia Tech ought to get out in front. So following the meetings, she recruited three tech professors, two of which later became quite well known. One of them, Bill Atchison, who headed the computer center and was a math professor, actually was, at that time, 
chairman of the ACM, that's one of our uh, primary uh, professional associations that is the one that often does new curricula, uh, he was chair of that curriculum committee, interestingly. She helped them, or they helped her, prepare a proposal to NSF to create a program, to fund a program to create a master's degree in information science. She submitted, they submitted that to NSF. It was funded. And she carried through all of the paperwork and organizational stuff, and we know what that's like to get approval for a new degree from the Faculty Senate and the Board of Regents and so forth. This was all before they even knew <coughs> Vladimir Slomeka. So she and her team of three went to a conference, one of the information science conferences in Chicago. And they listened to a number of talks. One of them was by a man by the name of Vladimir Slomeka. And he gave apparently a very good talk and they liked what he was saying. So they went up to talk to him after his talk. I'm sure many of you are where you are or where you were because you made a contact at a professional meeting like that. And they convinced him to visit Atlanta. So we very likely wouldn't have a college of computing in the form if it is, it is today if it hadn't been for this remarkable woman and those that followed her. She never met Pat Creasine. She probably never met Ray Miller. She certainly would have known Pete Jensen. And she lived long enough after retiring in 1971 to see the growth of the uh, School of Information and Computer Science. After retiring, she and her husband moved to Monroe, Georgia, east of here, along with her 3,000 personal cookbooks. She was a master chef and enjoyed her cooking, gardening, and four grandchildren for the remainder of her life. Before we end this story, however, and we might even have time for a few questions and answers, or a few questions at least, I've left out an important person that I skipped over in describing Vladimir's structuring of the first school curriculum. Again, let's let Vlad make that introduction. Now you mentioned um, the difficulty of hiring a faculty. Before I can talk about that, I need to talk about the discipline itself, because before we decide whom to hire, we, know to, we, we need to know what the person ought to do and what to know. I would like to go back to 1945, where a man by the name of Vannevar Bush wrote an article by the title of As We May Think. Uh, that article was published in uh, the Atlantic Monthly. And Bush was at MIT and he was advisor to the president, uh, Roosevelt, I believe, at the time. Or, uh, in that article, <clears throat> Bush almost uncannily describes the future of digital technology. And the way he describes it is in terms of what today we know as the Internet. In other words, he says that in, in information, digital information technology will at one point make it possible for any scientist anywhere in the world instantaneously to obtain any information anywhere in the world and that the information will be stored and distributed all around the world. <clears throat> now that article has become a kind of a uh, guide uh, uh, for information science. <clears throat> I believe that the National Science Foundation, when they read it, they thought about it and said we need to fund this. And when they funded Georgia Tech, they funded us to prepare people for those careers uh, to develop, design, and build the information system described by Bush. Uh, <clears throat> Bush's idea uh, lay dormant for about 10 years. Everyone referred to it, but uh, there were no people to do much about that until NSF started the program here. So that article has become to me something that uh, led the development of the curriculum at Georgia Tech. So we get back to the original thought. That article by Vannevar Bush, I think it is pronounced Vannevar, 
properly. Uh, many of us in the field, certainly of a certain age, have heard of, have read, know about. The device that he describes there is called the Memex, and I certainly remember hearing about that for a very long time. But I don't know that I've ever discovered, ever known of a place that could trace its history specifically to that article and the use of it. And that includes Carnegie Mellon, where I did my PhD and was certainly one of the early pioneers. Certainly, I mean, Herb Simon was probably one of, of Vannevar Bush's uh, colleagues. So he certainly would have known about it. So certainly there was that idea, that concept of the digitization of information and the use of it, not just the hardware and software that performs some set of tasks. So I think we can trace our history back to this gentleman. And by the way, I hope you will note his choice of neckwear. <laughs> for those of you that don't see well. The article that's mentioned is on the website that I'll tell you about in a moment. But before we finish this little journey, uh, let me share a personal thought. As the founding dean, delving into this history, Discovering so much about the remarkable people and amazing results that came before me. And of course, there are scores of other interesting stories. But of connecting them into an arc of a story that runs from that article to what we have today. It's been a truly humbling experience. It's also, in some ways, a comforting experience because it, it underscores the, or encourages the realization that all of us have been, are, a part of something larger than ourselves that's 70 years old. And that perhaps what we do, in some small way, will help push it along its path of contribution to the larger world. Our shared history is one of which we all should be very proud and work every day to enrich and extend. I'll be glad to take questions. I will give not the usual professorial answer of 50 minutes, but try to keep them to 50 seconds. And of course, we know that building, and there lies the endless future. Um, I'll flip to this just to show it to you. Uh, there are a few copies of this little handout that are available. Um, if you go to that first uh, URL, GT Computing 2550 Gatech Edu, um, then you We'll see timeline, and under that you'll see all kinds of things, which include a written version of this speech, eventually the video, um, after it gets doctored up and the inanities are taken out, or whatever Mike and his crew do with it, um, and um, uh, a number of other documents, including um, the, uh, a copy of, as we may think, in case you want to read it, uh, a written memoir of Ray Miller, done in 2002. Um, the Dorothy Crossland story, not an interview of her, but again, Marilyn um, uh, uh, Summers uh, put together a nice video, um, I don't know what the occasion was, but about her, about uh, Dorothy's uh, life. And of course, the interview with uh, Vladimir that we've seen, and a very big, Timeline not finished, not complete, but is the basis of and gives you references to the things I've talked about today. So with that, I am happy to take questions. If there are any, I have answers. Thank you. 
So some of you in the room can, I'm sure, correct or extend what I said. Um, I have a comment. To that. Yes. The most famous article by Maniba Bush, Bush is Science, the Endless Frontier. Right. Which was a report to the president and actually was the basis for all research funding before that. That's correct. And it's the basis for the National Science Foundation. He's credited with being the creator of NSF. Uh, there is now an, uh, an annual NSF Vannevar Bush Award. Um, so, yes. Uh, my name is Kyle Wong. I'm a third year computer science major here. Now, Good. I, I realized, or well, I noticed that other universities, they have uh, their computer science programs in college of engineering. I like how Georgia Tech has their own college right. of computing. So I was wondering what the uh factors went into that um, when making that decision. That was a result, uh, can you pick that up okay, Andrew? Uh, that was a result of the reorganization started in 1988 by former President Cresign, who understood I talked about his vision, his ability to envision the future. He understood in depth and in technical detail, even though he was an economist by training, the importance of what we could achieve once everything was digital. And he understood that someday there should be, computing should be just as important as any other discipline. And his words to me when I came here as dean was, I want you to lead, you and your faculty, to lead everything on campus having to do with computing, but not own it. And furthermore, I made it a college, beca and because there was a lot of discussions the, that Pete Jensen guided, that uh, there were a number of people that said, well, yes, it ought to be in engineering, it ought to be in science, et cetera, et cetera. And Pat, I don't know the details, wouldn't let that happen. He said, Peter, you need to be at the table where the resources are passed out, where you can haggle with the deans of engineering and everything else. That's so you, you touch about a very important po point, and when I go all over the country, uh, I have one of the talks about uh, uh, computing at Georgia Tech, the Georgia computing uh, the Georgia Tech model, and uh, I'm very, very proud. Uh, of course, I had nothing to do with it, that we have a college. And, Neither of us did. And, uh, and that's, um, everybody actually envies us. Even Berkeley, some fantastic places. Berkeley is a division instead of EECS that is inside engineering. So MIT, similarly, they're fantastic, but still. Carnegie Mellon is a college, and actually, I think that was the idea. He came, for, he came, he was a provost at. Right, I did not go into the whole history. That's very interesting. Uh, Pat's personal history, uh, resume. Uh, I had a lot of that, and my best editor, my wife, said, look, don't just read his resume. Tell interesting stories about him. Other questions, comments, Rich? So I was waiting for you. You, you, you hinted at, at this, um, and, and as you were writing, writing the, uh, the history, uh, John Gale who was a, a writer in the school for right. many years, uh, reminded us that, that the, the origin of the breadth of the college also was due to Vladimir Putin of not creating an academic department. Even though he had heard an academic program, he viewed this place as, <coughs> as a lot of think tank. Think tank. So, so, so his, his, his interest was in assembling people from many different disciplines to work on, on the uh, problems that, that he thought were, right. were, were important. And, and you can carry that philosophy through you know, the, last, the last 50 years. That's right. See where, where we got, where we got this, uh, this particular heritage from. That's right. And as he said, and clearly was the case, he used the curriculum as a guide to hiring. First, because he had people in different areas. So if he hadn't fashioned that curriculum in the way that he did, he would have wound up with a, a lot of coders or a lot of hardware engineers or something. As opposed to library scientists, philosophers, linguists, systems theorists, mathematicians. <coughs> 
By the way, Chrisine, who is actually the one that caused us to be a college, uh, also created the College of Business, and uh, also the one that decided to leverage the Olympics Games in Atlanta and to turn Georgia Tech into a residential university. Because before, everybody was a commuter. The story of Pat Chrisine... And uh, let me finish. Oh, sorry. And <laughs> And when he died, uh, he was quite obnoxious, a visionary, but quite obnoxious. And, and when he died, Andrew Young uh, said about him that he did everything right and made everybody mad. Partially true. He didn't make everybody mad. Um, in any event, other questions, comments? So give uh, Peter a final round of applause. Thank you.